we have Elliot Divini. Hello. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, I've been watching a lot of these Skype things online on YouTube, um, sort of movie reunions and actors talking with other actors. So I'm happy to uh, participate in one of these. Very cool. So, okay, we haven't, you and I even haven't ever really talked about editing. Right. Which I'm very, very excited about because uh, there are a number of, when people just say, oh, I'm an editor or I'm, I'm editing something, there are so many parts of editing that we don't often think of. Um, such as when you're writing a script, you're already editing while you're writing. Right. Or, you know, when you're filming a scene, you're already, as <clears throat> if you have a background in editing, you might be directing the scene or producing the scene with the idea in your mind that, oh, we're not gonna shoot this next. You know, the, we're, the scene's three pages long, but we get to this point and it just feels like a really strong way to cut right there, you know? Um, and, and you don't film the rest of the scene. You know, you might just move on to the next scene or the next sequence or whatever. Um, and then of course, when you're actually editing, editing, yeah. Um, then you're reshaping and all these things. Um, yeah. us, or Carl joined us. Hello, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Um, Elliot and I will talk for a little while and then we'll just open it up for a, a large you know, Q&A. Everybody can participate. Um, the first thing I wanted to visit with you about is what, well, I want to know your process of editing, but I also want to know when did you begin to practice the art of editing? Yeah, so uh, I guess my, my general process is I focus on performance. If I'm, if I'm editing a scene with actors, I always want to get the best moments of performance in. So immediately I forget about what the camera looks like, the shot scale, all that stuff. I try and edit a scene together as it's written uh, with all of the best moments. I, I want performance, I want acting. And then once I'm happy with that, I'll go through and kind of massage it and change some, sh change some things so that there's a better flow to, to the, the visuals and how things are put together. But for me, and I think it comes from a, a doing independent film where there's not always a lot of takes and there's not always a lot of options. And um, I, I, I like to prioritize acting and, and have everything else kind of come secondary to that. And uh, the way I got into editing, I used to make movies as a kid uh, with, with family and friends in the basement. And in the beginning, we didn't have editing software. So we would have to edit in camera. So we'd set up a home video camera facing a room, act out a scene as if it were a play, cut the camera, uh, change to a new room, come up with a new scene, act it out. And so uh, we would have little movies that were essentially scenes that were um, composited together. That's all we knew how to, how to do. And then in 2000, around 2000, the first version of iMovie came out with uh, IMAX, the colorful IMAX. They had like the bright orange, the bright blue, and suddenly we were able to edit our movies where we could do shot reverse shot or do special effects. And it was very rudimentary in the beginning. It was just, you were able to cut A and B together and do a little basic sound mixing. But for us, it was so exciting to be able to actually start editing. And in the beginning, I didn't even, I didn't know what the process was. I always heard about editing, but didn't really know specifically what it was. And thought it had something to do with special effects. And I kind of learned a lot of stuff at the same time I was learning iMovie. I was in uh, TV production at school, putting on the local news show, and then kind of learning cameras. And then uh, new versions of iMovie would come out where suddenly you could do slow motion or suddenly you could do voiceovers. And then in version two, version three, version four, and then slowly mastered every version of iMovie kind of learning every new piece that came along with it. And then eventually got launched into Final Cut and then now Adobe Premiere and now it's like I can kind of do anything. But I sort of learned out of necessity, I was making movies with my friends and 
nobody else was was doing the editing or knew how to do it and so i just kind of figured it out because i was excited about it did you ever learn or play with uh avid or did you just go from iMovie yeah. to final cut to premiere i, I took a um i took a course uh, minnesota school of business i uh community college i learned avid because at that time all the big jobs in minneapolis where i was you had to know avid and so i learned it through this course and never really never used it again because all of the jobs i had after that were either final cut or premiere um, yeah but it was also nice in in high school and then in film i got to do some uh tape to tape real editing where you had like two vhs's in a deck and then like a it was fed through sort of a flatbed and you were editing things that way with like buttons on a console and then I did some stuff in film school editing on film like changing film in a in a closed bag so no light gets in and then editing on a steam back flat reel and sometimes actually cutting out the shots and like hanging them up on the wall so I kind of learned a lot of different styles of filmmaking and editing and having gone through all that I'm really appreciative now of just non-linear editing and being able to film forever with a GoPro or a Canon and then just bring that stuff into the computer and you're, you're editing with it right then and there. So I, I kind of gained an appreciation through learning all the different formats and how people used to do it back in the day. Yeah, it's crazy. My yeah. first movie was edited on film because wow. we didn't, have, we did there was no such thing as HD in 1997. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, I mean, we didn't even do a digital intermediate. It was yeah. totally film process. Yeah. And uh, the editor I was working with, it was miserable because he was like, well, at the time I was like, you know, 20 years old. So he seemed like he was 85 and like, yeah. you know, whatever. Right. He probably was 35 and I just thought he was so, you know, whatever. But uh, his, his uh, tonality, I don't know, the way that he would, uh, look at art or look at a scene, it wasn't necessarily about performance. I think for him, it was more about the cut, the cutting. Yeah. And he's like, well, that doesn't cut together. Right. You know, for instance. And I said, well, watch, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then, and then I'm like, we're just going to do this. We're going to cut from this to this. Yeah. And you'll see that it will cut together because we just cut it together. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's actually one of my new tricks is if I'm editing something, I like to get it sounding good. So if you just close your eyes and forget about the visuals, how does it sound? The, the pacing of it, the energy, the emotions, because if you get it, if you get that right, you can usually go in and fix things with the visuals. Well, exactly. And what you said earlier about focusing on the acting first, yeah. what, what one of the truths is, it, as it relates to cinema in general, is that the viewer as long as it sounds good, yes, yes, then they will tolerate any amount of visual inferiority. It's the, the Blair Witch Syndrome. It's like, we're fine with shaky camera, black and white, out of focus, but we have to be able to hear what they're saying. Totally, and yeah. likewise, it you know, you can- It took several movies to figure that out. You know, when I made my first movie, I had no idea that that was the ethic. And then I had to kind of learn that the hard way, that sound is your, your priority. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if, if you are gonna, let's say, if you have a limited budget or you only have certain amount of money, I say, throw it into that. Yeah, Because, absolutely. you know, if, if you've seen Blair Witch or Inland Empire, the David Lynch movie that he did, and, yeah. um, or any any movie, if even if it looks absolutely stunning, if yeah. if it doesn't sound perfect, it, it you've lost them. Yes, and and I I love YouTube vlogs uh, and reality TV and stuff that's shot with GoPros. Like I don't care about the quality of the the filming. I like the storytelling and how it how it makes me feel or how it makes me react to it. Like one of my favorite movies ever is Jackass, and it's because it's just pure entertainment. The filming and the staging doesn't really matter, but the way it's edited and presented to you really gives you an experience. And so it was kind of, I learned that it doesn't, it doesn't matter, yeah, how, how good the, the footage looks or how good your camera is. It has to be edited, edited together properly in order for it to have an effect on the audience. So do you primarily today work only in Premiere? 
Yes. Uh, yeah. So every, every job I've had in the last five or six years has been Adobe Premiere. Um, so almost all of the edit houses I work at here in LA, uh, Adobe Premiere. And it's nice because everybody's on the cloud. So everyone is just constantly uh, uploaded to the newest version. And then with editing, there's all this side stuff, sound mixing, graphics, color correction. And the Adobe package is really nice because you get Photoshop, you get After Effects, you get Audition. So I'm constantly using all of these other apps. That's one thing is editing. It, it, it encompasses all of these um, side hustles like color correction, sound mix, special effects, um, CGI, titles, um, all on an independent film sometimes as the editor, you're being asked to do all of these things. You know, so you suddenly you're just thrust into the job of colorist when you don't have any experience in it. So uh, that's one cool thing about independent film is you're forced to just learn all of these different uh, aspects to editing. Whereas on a bigger project, like when I do editing for the NFL, all I do is edit. And then it, that goes to sound mix and then the clips go off to a graphics person to take out the green screen and there's this whole assembly line to it but on independent film oftentimes it's like everything gets filmed and then they just drop off a hard drive with the editor and they're like here make this work <laughs> i love that well and that's exactly yeah. what i did on <laughs> our most recent feature that we co-wrote yes um so and remind me to talk to you about having you help me with titles because that's oh, yeah one of the last things when the movie is totally done in the end of August, I mean, this cool. is an aside for everybody else. Nobody knows we've made this movie yet. It's not listed on the IMDb. It's been totally top secret. So yeah. this is the first public uh, discussion <laughs> about it, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll text you about that afterwards. <laughs> well, I love um, titles are one of my favorite aspects to movies because when you see a really exciting opening title sequence where the, the stylistically the text is is sewn into the story and the theme. That's that's really cool. Like um, Seven comes to mind, the opening credits from Seven or Watchmen or Deadpool. If a lot of a lot of movies will just throw up the text and like, here, this is who worked on the movie. But if you can if you can work it into the movie itself, where it feels like it's actually part of the presentation, to me that's really exciting because that means that that means the people that made the movie actually care about it and and, and put some thought into it. Totally, like North by Northwest also. Yes, yes, exactly. You know, all those that yeah, are just amazing. Movie, right. Yeah, completely. Um, when you watch a movie, are you focused? Are you aware of the editing or is it just decide? No, I mean, you, usually the first time I watch a movie, I'm just trying to keep up. You know, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a bad movie goer the first time around because uh, you know, the, the movie just kind of washes over you. So I don't like to be thinking too much about filmmaking or who made it or who the actors are. I like to just kind of have the experience of watching the movie. And then I like to rewatch it a second time where then I'm paying attention to the lighting and the camera work and the editing. So most movies I like, the, the editing is completely invisible. I think this was the approach for Raiders of the Lost Ark where you, the audience is not, they're supposed to forget the fact that they're watching a movie. They're supposed to get swept up in the story and not, I mean, it, it happens pretty quick where if you're watching something, you're just immediately darting back and forth between the shot, reverse shot, and your eyes just kind of follow the action on the screen and you forget you're watching a movie if it's a good movie. So th those are my favorite um, edits is when the edit is completely invisible and you forget you're watching a movie. What is your personal take? As I know, there's the rule yeah. But then there's also every single director or editor or performer's idea of the rule of crossing the line. Oh, yes. I, I, I love it when, it when there's a reason for it. I, like, I love it when it only happens one time and it's, it's some kind of psychological thing with a character or if the, if the camera physically like moves across the line. So I, I like it to be intentional. I mean, I think the rule is there for a reason. Um, I, I, I like when people break it as long as I feel like I, I'm in good hands as a viewer. I don't like it to be just sort of sloppily put together because it does get confusing. Um, I missed the memo on crossing the line. Exactly what are you referring to? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, and I didn't know this when I first started out, you know, I mean, yeah. 20 years ago, it, you don't notice, but, it, but basically it's like if, if one shot is me, 
and I'm looking this way and I'm talking to someone. Yeah. If we, right yeah. yeah. So if, if I'm, well, it depends on where our squares are located. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> on my, on my phone, yeah. I'm first. But uh, if Elliot and I are talking to each other and I'm facing this way and he's facing the opposite way, it makes sense that we're talking to each other. Now, if Elliot was facing this way talking to me and then it cut to me and I was also facing this way talking back to Elliot, your mind might think that we're on the same side of the room talking to somebody else or that we're not actually talking to each other. Yeah, the idea is that well, there's, a, there's an invisible line that connects two people that are talking and the camera should stay always on one side or the other of that line. So that and, and typically, the line of axes or something. Yeah, I always relate ah, it to okay. the direction of where the eyes are looking. Yeah. So if I'm over here and I'm, you know, right to left or left to right, then the other person is the opposite. They call it the, the 180 rule, right? Yes. The yeah, so the, yeah, the theory is that at any time you're only shooting one half of the room to, to right. keep the audience. And then, and then yeah, uh, there's something else about um, if you're gonna change the camera, it's gotta be more than 30 degrees on that axis. So if, you, if your shot only changes 10 degrees on that circle, it's still gonna be jarring. And then my other understanding is you can get around that with cuts. So if you and I are talking and you're looking screen right and I'm looking screen left and we cut away to somebody else that's listening to us on the other side of the room and we cut back to us, then I think we're free, in my mind, we're free to do whatever. It's only on an immediate cut if it looks weird that it becomes an issue. Yes, and if once you've established sort of the space in the room, let's say, yeah, and you know that these two guys are over there talking, yeah, and whoever else comes in is another thing, but you've got the spatial relation, yeah, then I think you can do it any old time, or it doesn't matter necessarily where the camera is because you already know where everyone's standing. Yeah, um, and then another important thing I think is is uh, orienting the audience with an establishing shot so that they know early on where everything is in the room. Unless it's some kind of mystery thing where a character is like the hangover, you know, then you might start on a on closer in on, on the hero. But typically you want, it's like a play. You want the audience to be able to, you want all your cards on the table at the beginning of a scene. So that, you know, the, the audience, the audience needs to know what's there. The audience needs to be upfront, I think, with what's happening in the story. If you were to, uh, let's say you were interested in, in becoming more of an editor or you wanted to get into it as an editor and you were just starting out as a, as a filmmaker, what films would you recommend to that person to watch or study or take a really sort of look at as just the, the rhythm and the editing? Um, I, would, I would start with either something Tarantino, so Pulp Fiction maybe, something where because I, I love the idea of Pulp Fiction has kind of a, a, a series of events that happen, but what makes it really fun and exciting is the way it's revealed to us. I mean, same with like M Memento. Memento is kind of all in the editing. And there's a, there's a feature on the DVD. Memento, if you don't know, is a movie that plays backward or the scenes sort of uh, play from in reverse chronology. On the DVD, you can watch it where everything has been reassembled in the right order and it's a totally different movie. Love oh, interesting. Yeah, oh like my you, kind of lose, you lose all of the mystery and, and the character. And the, the, whole, the whole thing with Memento is you get seduced into, into believing this character that turns out to have bad motives. But if you, watch, if you watch the regular version, that's all laid out in the opening scene. So all of the intrigue is gone. So I think that, that's a really good one where it's, the story is good no matter how you tell it. The characters are good, but the way the way the, the information is revealed to the audience is really interesting. So yeah, Memento, uh, I love Tarantino uh, for that same reason. And then I just watched um, Usual Suspects is amazing. The way, the way it's like the first half hour, the way everything kind of flows together. There are all these different scenes and settings and characters, but the, the, the music and the camera work is all kind of tied together where it feels like one big fluid thing. And the scene transitions are really good. Like there's one moment where it cuts to a rattling um, paint can inside of a garage and it's like really jarring as the cops are rounding up all of the suspects. 
so that's that's another one where it's like in the it's in the presentation that it becomes really exciting it's the way it's it's the way it's edited together what is your take on uh coverage i mean i i i just give me everything you can i i i say roll cameras always in all directions as many cameras as you can um because as an editor that you never know what's going to get you out of a jam or I mean, I've pulled stuff from before a take, you know, when the camera is, is settling in or, or, or grabbing focus. It's like, as an editor, it's all up for grabs. It's all, it's all part of the buffalo that you can use, to use that metaphor. You know, the Native Americans used every part of the buffalo. So I like to, I say, give me as much coverage as you can. And, and as the editor, I'll make it work as best as possible. I mean, I know that can kind of complicate things as you're filming. They, they say if you have two cameras, they're both going to suffer because you're having to compromise the lighting and the staging of both. And what's in the background, you know, you have to then be very careful about how you're positioning crew and stuff. So I wouldn't want to complicate the shoot in that regard. But I would say, especially now with digital cameras and film doesn't cost anything, just roll always because it, it doesn't hurt. And as the editor, I don't care. Like I would rather have too much versus not enough. Exactly, because it really sucks when you get into the middle of a scene and you, you need to cut away to something and there's no footage to cut away to. Yeah. Yeah, and then there are some movies where it's then you end up going into, you, you can like request a reshoot from the filmmakers, but that usually won't happen. And then, you, and then you're like looking at stock footage. You're like, okay, we need an establishing shot of this dock. Let's just go to Shutterstock and see what we can find. So it's, it's kind of, again, it's whatever, whatever you can find to make it. <laughs> But it's, it's hard because oftentimes the, the editing is like the very last stop uh, on the train. And so all of the decisions have already been made and usually there's no more money left. And so you're kind of, you're kind of stuck with what, whatever is presented to you. So it can, be a, it can be very challenging and frustrating, but it's also, it's so much problem solving when you get in the editing room. It's like, how do we make this work with what we have? Well, and, and to re repeat the famous saying, you know, there's, there's three films yeah. in every film. There's the film you write, the film you shoot, and the film you edit. Yeah. Um, have you ever worked on a project where those three stages and, and the various differences between those three points were drastically different? Yeah, so I think it has a lot to do with my personality, but almost every movie I've worked on, the writing stage is really fun because it's all potential and you're just making stuff up, you know? You're like, okay, a giant alien ship uh, blows up the White House. You know, you can type that in 10 seconds and you're done. But then filming is, filming is always compromised. It's always stressful. You're always, like I always have, you always have the idea of this thing you want to do in script form. And then in filming, you, you have to break it down into something that's workable or something that you can actually capture. So it's always like, for me, it's always heartbreak on the set. I'm always over budget. I'm always behind schedule, always having to pick between two things that I love in the movie, like cutting scenes that we just can't get. It's just always like, you always feel like you're in the trenches, at least on my movies. But then you get it into the, then you get into the editing room and then it's fun again. Then you're building stuff back up and you're problem solving. And there aren't all these people relying on you, staring at you, waiting to make decisions. So I kind of like, I like sitting at a computer alone and going at my own pace and being creative. And to me, that's writing and that's editing. So almost every project I've worked on, the being on set is stressful. Like uh, I'm always running around, putting out fires. I always have a stomach ache from craft services, always getting up way too early, sleep deprived. It just, it, uh, I've never had fun on set. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Hilarious. Well, it's it is a very different place to be. Yes. Um, I one, love. I say the one thing I like to do on set is EPK or behind the scenes, because then you're running your own little unit and you're not really involved with whatever problems are going on on the set. And in fact, if there are problems on the set, that's good for you because that's part of your story that you're telling. So I do, I do, because then you can kind of be a fly on the wall and not be as stressed out as as all of the troops, so to speak. But totally. And, and for, me, for it, those, it, it's always a big, a big curvy line between pre-production and production and post-production. 
yeah. And, and for those of you who, who are, are, might be newbies that are listening to this today or later on, uh, uh, EPK is an electronic press kit or behind the scenes um, filming that I typically like to do for everything that I'm working on. For yeah. the most previous feature, we just had stills all the time, but I didn't have an actual camera rolling. Typ typically, I like to have like a substantial sort of behind the scenes sort of documentary happening. Yeah, um, we just didn't do it. What do you, um, do you have a, a part of your process is, uh, does it include when you're editing a sequence, you, let's say you've, you've focused on the performance first and yeah. you've really felt it. Do you, at that point, before or after that, do you ever work with music at the same time? Yes, I like to get music in there right away. Um, so I have a, I have a big iTunes library of all famous movie soundtracks. So if I'm editing a scene, I like to just find something that feels appropriate, whether it be Hans Zimmer or John Williams, and just get something in there to start editing to. Because to me, that like editing is always music plus visuals. Um, if, if there are scenes that play out without music, but they're, they're very intentionally done that way. And so it, as I, if I approach a scene, I like the combination of music and, and material. And the, the, the track you put in changes the, the feeling and the mood of the scene so much that you're like a, a mad scientist at that point, where you can, you can have your scene kind of roughly edited and then swap in a different track and suddenly the scene feels completely different. So that's kind of my favorite part of editing is you're, you're a bit of an alchemist is you're just like, you're putting different elements into a stew to see what pops off the best. And that's why I really like the early stages of editing when you're just kind of seeing the takes for the first time and just beginning to play around with the footage. Cause that, to me, that excitement kind of dwindles as you go along. Sometimes you're editing a movie for six months or a year. So I like to, I like to really capitalize on that initial excitement. And then cool. for, for me, one thing I like to do is if I'm, when I edit, I, I ignore the script. So a lot of times the director will give you the materials in the script and say, here's what you should follow. I forget about like, I like to, to figure it out just based on what I'm seeing. So you can usually figure out how a scene goes together because this, this bit of dialogue will lead into this bit of dialogue and then you'll start to recognize um, repeated lines and things like that. But for me, it's a good way to become familiar with the footage. And I like to do all my own syncing and all my own organizing. Like I hate to have an assistant editor because I like to, I like that process of just syncing taped uh, takes and watching raw footage and just kind of becoming familiar with everything. I agree with you on that. Like I love, uh, even if I'm working with another editor on yeah. a project, I actually prefer to do the sync. Right because it, it reminds me of what footage do I have actually? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, or how did it go? Or, you know, what did we actually get? Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's informative. Uh, there's also something to be said about film editing could be considered musical on its own. Yes. You know, if we, if we yeah. go, you know, if we go back to like Hitchcock where there would be like super wide you know, the people are like this big in the frame, right? Yeah. And then there's like a cut closer here, cut closer here. Yeah. Then there's like a closer, jump cut, closer. Yeah. And then it goes closer, jump cut, closer. And then there's like this, like all the way back again. Yes. That's very musical. Yes, absolutely. Um, what, uh, another, another movie I would recommend for uh, people looking to get into editing is Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom because there is an amazing uh, interplay between what's happening on screen and the musical score. So it's al it almost feels like they were kind of written at the same time. There's this uh, great sequence in the middle where uh, Indy's on drugs and he's kind of moving around this palace and uh, every one of his movements is sort of synchronized with a John Williams instrument. Where it feels like a, it feels like a duet almost. Um, and that's something you, you, you rarely see in film where the, the music really feels like it's a part of the production. So it's something that's like really hard to pull off and takes a lot of planning, but it's, when it happens, it's really cool. Amazing, that's a great uh, recommendation for sure. Yeah, and it's, um, just, it's just a great movie all around. Um, what are you currently, I know that you've got a lot of 
fires cooking and you, yes. you've got you've got one of those industrial kitchen yeah. <laughs> stoves with like 35 burners going yeah. what are you editing at the moment so i work full-time for netflix i do uh, sizzle reels for netflix youtube for various um regions and territories so japan u.s canada netherlands latin america so that's like 60 70 hours a week and then on top of that i'm editing a short film I'm editing a music video, and then I have my own uh, YouTube series that I do, where I, I host various uh, educational things and stunts, and then uh, edit it all together and, and put it up on YouTube. But to me, that's really magical because I can, I do it all myself. It's kind of a one-man show, and it's so uh, liberating to be in the edit, uh, editing my interview and being like, oh, I wish I had this line. But because it's all here in my studio, I can just turn on the camera, record the line, and then get it into the edit. So when you can be uh, pushing, editing, writing, filming, kind of all at the same time, it's really magical. Because normally it's, it, it's very segmented. Like we said, it's like an assembly line. But when you can, when you can kind of work on, on things independently of that assembly line, it's a lot of fun. So it's, it's amazing as the editor to be like, oh, I want this line in the edit, go do it. You know, that's, you, you can never do that on a movie or a commercial or a sports edit. But if you're doing a little rinky dink YouTube show on GoPros, you can. So that's, I really like having, I really like uh, having kind of the bigger projects that I make money on and then just having um, fun side projects where I like to do animations and uh, do tabletop, like cut out letters and then animate them frame by frame. So I've, I'm always working on something. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is a lesson or an example to look at or study of really terrible Ooh. editing? Can you think of one? Let me, let me, I got to think for a second. I mean, like the, the room is famous as a as a bad movie, but I don't know that it's necessarily the editing that stands. Out. Uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think the editing's bad at all in that movie. <laughs> I think there are, there are probably a lot of movies that are considered bad where the editing is still good. So it's yeah, it's like a, I don't know. It's kind of hard to. I can't think of one off the top of my head. I mean, I've seen some bad movies, sure. <laughs> Let me get back to you on that one. Okay. Well, and, and there, there may not be something by the end of the show. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. I, you know, after I asked that, I, I was curious if you had one, but then I couldn't think of one either. Um, I've never really thought about that. That's a good, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm almost positive. I've seen one. I just, yeah. it's not coming to me. Yeah. Give me a minute. I'll think of one. All right. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on, um, the differences between like, let's say a uh, five minute or 10 minute shot in like a Tarkovsky film that doesn't cut to anything. Yeah. yeah. Versus the fast, 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 fast cut. Uh, to, me, the, to me, the long take is so much more impressive because anybody can just edit a bunch of stuff together uh, fast, really quickly. That doesn't take any talent, but lining up a big grand five minute shot where there's dialogue running and a camera's moving and lights are moving and there's background, like just as a filmmaker, I'm, I'm much more impressed by that. And I love it when, um, uh, I, I think like in Jaws, there are several, several long takes, but I love it when, when they're not overt, when they don't like rub it in your face. Like, uh, it took me a long time to realize all these long takes were in Jaws until I saw a YouTube video where somebody had pointed it out. But I love when, when those kinds of things are just kind of buried in the movie. And if you're enjoying the story, you don't really notice what's happening. But I, yeah, I feel like, the, I feel like the, the really quick cutting is, is it's cheap in a lot of ways. You know, and, unless there are certain movies, like I, I think uh, Darren Aronofsky does it really well, like Requiem for a Dream. He does, the, he does a lot of fast cutting, but it all feels very intentional. And they, even though they're fast, those shots line up really well and have, a, have an impact on you. But you see some horror movies or fight scenes where it's just cut, 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 cut. And most of the time when I see that, it's, it, it feels to me like they're covering something up, like they're hiding some lack of filmmaking. 
Well, and that's what always it, like amazes me is that if you're watching some like Jason Bourne movie, yeah. you know, and they've spent tens of hundreds of who millions of billions, you know, and yeah. and it, it looks like they really could have done it in the backyard and just cut it together in such a way that you it would have looked the same. Yeah, actually, okay, so I I would argue the the latter Bourne identity movies have bad editing because they're anytime they get into a car chase or an action scene, it's super shaky cam, and then it's all cut together super fast, so you can't, you can't tell what's happening. So I, I, love, I love big, deliberate stuff that happens on screen, where it's very clear who's, who's fighting whom and, and where it's taking place, and the choreography is very, it's very easy to understand. Hey, uh, Steve, uh, yeah. really great really really sorry i have to cut out thanks elliot Thank um, you. oh absolutely we'll, really we'll catch awesome. you next time i will i will see the replay for sure thank you very much cool. thanks for joining us okay right. take care um which sort of going back to the french connection with the like the most famous first best car chase ever filmed yeah. right yeah. yeah something like that where you even if it's kind of like dramatic and it back then i guess it could have been shaky for back then but you're still seeing the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I, I love uh, the, the Matrix uh, Reloaded Freeway Chase, where they, they built, a, I think, a mile of freeway. And it's this big, elaborate chase. But it's always very clear what's happening, who's where and what cars are in front and in back. And it's all, it's all very cinematic. And it all looks very cool. And I think if you have all of that stuff on point, you don't need to, you don't need to shake the camera. Yeah, I, there was a period of time in my life when I was uh, sort of, well, let's just say crankier than I usually am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, because in my, as I mentioned earlier, in my, in my book called Filmmaking Confidential, it's, uh, uh, it could be a little offensive, some yeah. things I said. There was a period of time when I really, if I saw a film and it was either overly shaky or looked like they didn't even care, yeah. I... I wanted to go and buy a, a tripod yes. and send it to that director. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, just, just like, just put it down, just set it, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I agree. It's sometimes, you know, it's especially useful. Uh, I mean, when I, I don't know, it's interesting. When I'm editing a scene, acting is important to me, but it's also the visual aspect, primarily personally. Yeah. Um, so if I was gonna say, try to make a, a point or something, I would have like a lot of still solid things and then cut to a really dramatic like handheld thing. Yes. Um, as opposed to making the whole scene handheld. Right, yes. And I, I, I like that uh, David Fincher said that, or somebody said it about David Fincher that when, when he uses a close up, you know it's an important moment because it's only like once per scene that you'll get like a, like a, a actual close-up on an actor's face. Otherwise, things are playing out in two shots and wides. And I, I, I like that approach too, where, where you're, you're, not, you're using your close-up like uh, a finishing move. You know, it's, something, it's not something to use all the time. It's only for those big emotional beats. Um, I, I feel the same way about cranes. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Uh, I saw this film once uh, from uh, up and comer, I wouldn't say aspiring, because I think he'd made a couple of movies, or, or shorts at least. Um, but it was almost like you could tell the day when he had the budget for the crane, because the crane was in every scene. And it was like this whole, like, yeah. like just get off the crane already. Yeah. Um, to some degree, I feel that way about drones now also. Right. It, it's so cinematic to have a, any, uh, I'm always excited working on an independent film when there's any kind of drone footage because it immediately like feels like the budget is twice of what it originally was. It's, right. just, it's just instant production value because it's, it's something that independent filmmakers could, could only recently do. And, and before that, you, you would have to hire a helicopter pilot. So it's something we, like in the past, we've only seen in big budget movies, but now basically anybody can do it. Yeah, but it's great. I, I, I love drone footage. It's so it's so fun to edit. What is what is a particular? Uh, do you have you have you seen anything new, like a new way of filming something in a drone recently? Ah, uh, no. 
Um, I mean, the, so the newest thing I've seen is there's some kind of little, like, it's like a Nerf football, but it films uh, in all directions in super slow motion. So the idea is, is there's like a camera shaped like a football. And so someone's like doing a skateboard trick, you throw this camera past them and it films in all directions, 360 and super slow mo. And so you bring that back into the editing software and suddenly you have this like crazy, it's like bullet time from the matrix. So oh, that's, that's cool. I've done a little, really bit, cool. a little bit of like augmented reality stuff and uh, 3D stitching and virtual reality. So I, th that stuff all really freaks me out because that like everything we know about editing is completely gone once we go into four dimensions, right? Well, and, and likewise, you know, what about uh, virtual reality films? Yes, exactly. It's, I mean, it, it feels like it's inevitable, um, but it's very intimidating because film has, has been done basically the same way for a hundred years. And, and now there's all this new technology which has the ability to completely uproot the entire system. So it's a, it's a little scary, but it's also exciting because, you know, how, how can storytelling change then if, if suddenly you're in the, in the environment, you're in the movie, it's like last action hero. Totally. Well, and I think that even if that is available and becomes really, really popular, I don't think movies as we know them are going anywhere anytime soon. That's what's cool is, is there's still something about going to a movie theater with a crowd of people and watching a movie projected on a 35 millimeter projector frame by frame through an old machine uh, projected on a big screen. There's still something like really magical about that experience. And that's kind of the, that's the way it was for a very long time. And it's sad just that, that because of COVID and just because of streaming and stuff that people don't go to the movies as much. So right. it's, it's weird as a filmmaker to think about people watching your movie on their phone, you know, or, or Isn't that, on, yes. on their computer when it, it, for a hundred years, it was people sitting in a theater together as a community and kind of feeding off of one another. That, that's a really magical thing that's lost is if a group of people are, are laughing together or scared together or excited together, it's like a concert, you know, there's an energy in the air. And if you're watching a movie by yourself, it's just not the same. Yeah, exactly. Um, we've got about five or 10 minutes left. So I thought we'd open it up to a Q and A from anybody that has a question for Elliot about um, editing or uh, could be a technical question, could be whatever you guys want, if you have anything. Or if anyone can think of a movie that has bad editing. I have a question. Yeah. Um, well, you, you already, Steve already covered, uh, you know, like the long takes versus short takes. I think of probably the most recent is 1917. Oh, you know, they, yes. Um, but I, and I agree with you. I like the, uh, I watch a lot of old movies and I, I love watching the film. Like I saw Shadow of a Doubt on yeah. film, like yeah. in, in a theater on their film. It was just amazing. Uh, my question for you is, um, do, do you ever write any music for any of the stuff that you edit or do because yes. I know you were saying that is very musical. Yes. Uh, so I, uh, I've, I've made three movies and I did the music for all three of those. So I have just a very basic music setup. I, um, I play a MIDI keyboard into GarageBand and then from there I can uh, synthesize various orchestra instruments, you know, strings and brass. So I, yeah. love, I love doing a film score because like I said, it, yeah, it's like, score is kind of half of the story it feels like to me um and yeah. then the movie the visuals are on the other side so i i love creating music it's usually only for my own stuff there was one movie where i um scored somebody else's movie but normally it's it's kind of just on my own stuff i just watched uh x-men and i noticed uh the film composer john ottman edits and yeah. i just watched uh, days of future past but i mean the editing the way the music yeah. goes and john ottman to me he's, he's a great film composer and yeah, he edits well, all of the brian singer films it's just yeah, amazing there are, there are very few editor slash composers in the industry that i'm familiar with like um robert rodriguez john ottman and that might be it you know there's it's but to yeah. me it makes so much sense to be pushing the editing and the score at the same time or to have have a, a one unit that's doing both of them because they're so intertwined. But 
I believe John Ottman did both the music and the editing for Usual Suspects, which was one of the movies. Right. We talked about he, he does the editing and this film scores for pretty much every Brian Singer film. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, that he, that's what he brings to the table is both, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I, I love doing, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm not like uh, trained as a composer. So I don't, I don't have a ton of confidence at it, but I love doing it. I love doing short films and little music videos and things like that. But music, music to me is so, it, it's all creative. A lot of editing is very technical and problem solving and dealing with different formats and things. But I love, I love writing and music because they're all, it's just all creative. So that's, that to me is the most fun place to be. But at the same time, you have to kind of be in the mood to, to be creative. You can't, uh, you have to be in the right frame of mind. So sometimes if I'm, if I'm in a bad mood or whatever, I prefer editing because you can just, you can just sit down and do editing no matter what you're going through. It doesn't, you don't have to have the right headspace. But if I'm writing or if I'm doing music, I kind of have to be in the zone. Thank you. Cool. <clears throat> Does anybody else have anything to ask? Um, you asked, uh an example of a film that had bad editing yes and i i we i watched one with my girlfriend during quarantine and it was little woman and i believe it was written and directed by the same person i thought it was well written yeah but the editing was bothering me the whole time it felt very arbitrary like sure. like there was no inspiration between any of the cuts and, and it was something i noticed and for me to notice it would mean it would be like removing me from the experience yeah, that, it, it, i don't know if anyone's seen that I, I mean, I've, it was up for an Academy Award, right? Woman, Not for editing, not for editing yeah. But yeah, it's like, it, it's kind of like we were talking about the, you, editing has to be pretty bad for it to stand out to you while you're, yeah. like, for it to take you out of the movie. Um, one other example I heard recently was Bohemian Rhapsody, the oh. Queen movie. I think because the two of the members of Queen were like producer, executive producers on the movie. And yeah. so one of the big complaints is that the, the editing is just like, they have to show Brian May as many times as they show the drummer. So it's like, it, it was, uh, it all feels very um, equal, the coverage. So it, it's not, they don't, they don't cut to a reaction shot when, when it makes sense someone's listening to an important point. It's like, oh, we got to show all the members of the band in this scene so that it doesn't feel like any one of them is too important. And so the whole thing just feels, like you said, arbitrary or kind of, watered down or it doesn't feel like it was very directed that sounds like too many cooks in the kitchen yeah yeah exactly totally and you know that reminded me of uh the same sort of similar reason not just the making sure all the musicians were shown but cutting to the crowds in the stadiums in the wrong places yeah which yeah. is exactly the same mistake as the film Avita that madonna was in so Oh. She goes out to do the Argentina thing and the camera is getting closer and closer. And right before you think it's going to stop and just stay there, you're way on the other side of the square and there's five or 10,000 extras. Yeah. And they wanted the production value of 10,000 actual extras there, right. which has just taken you emotionally away from the performance of the main actor. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's like the whole thing starts to fall apart at that point. Yeah, and I, it's funny because I brought that up to a famous actress friend of mine, and she was very, she's also very historical, very interested in history. So for her, it was more important to see the crowd of 10,000 people yeah. than it was to actually be connected to the character, which I thought was really interesting. Right. Yeah, that's kind of a weird approach. Yeah, I, I really like, um, I'm getting into Edgar Wright movies lately because of the editing. Um, I heard that, so for, for Baby Driver, there's the, the, the big finale um, set to the, that rock and roll song with the yodeling. I can't think of the name at the moment, but uh, allegedly um, Edgar Wright wrote that scene with this song in mind and filmed all of the different action beats to a specific point in the song so that when the hero is jumping over the car, that happens at the exact moment in the song when there's a, a guitar bend or something. So I really like that approach where the, the music is treated almost like a performance, like it's almost one of the actors. And even like while you're writing this, Tarantino does this too, where he picks out songs 
as he's writing. Like, oh, this will become the theme song for, for this guy, or this will be how we'll introduce this time period. So I like, yeah, I like the idea of keeping music in mind way ahead of time. And then there's, uh, uh, I guess the Wachowskis for uh, Cloud Atlas, they, they composed the music first. So they, they wrote the music, it was done, and then they went and filmed. It would play the music on set for the actors, so they knew like kind of what the emotion was for that scene. Because uh, again, music is always the very last thing that anybody ever thinks about. Because the composer is even lower on the totem pole than the editor. So like when I've done it as composer, you you're just give it's like the movie's coming out in two weeks or something. Like just give us music. And so you, you, you rarely have any control over the process at that point. So I, I really admire it when editing or music is considered very early in the process. I think it makes sense. Well, and it's also fun just as a visual person or a director to use the rhythm and the tone of the song yeah. as your map. You know, it, it becomes part of then the screenplay, like how Tarantino would, would do it, I would assume. You know, right. it's like, oh, this is going to inform me how I'm going to cut this scene. Yeah. you know, or how I'm going to film it and, and yeah. et, et cetera. And I think that's really great. There was a class I took at CalArts that was sort of about that called jazz editing. Yes. I, uh, that, that's one really special thing about Tarantino is how he'll get you in a scene set up to feel one way and then totally switch it on you where suddenly it's like violence and comedy and you're, you're torn and like, you're sort of torn apart as an audience member because you don't know how to feel. And it, it like, He'll set up a scene kind of in a classic way where you think you know what's going to happen or you think you understand the dynamics and then it's like the whole thing gets toppled. And he, he said it's like he's playing the audience like a symphony. You know, he's like conducting the symphony and the audience members in terms of how they will react and when they will happy versus sad. So I, I like that with the Tarantino as like a god or a puppet master who's like literally playing with the emotions of the audience. That's pretty cool. Amazing. Yeah. Well, Elliot, thank you so much for joining us today. Does anybody else have any last question for him before we go? Quick one. Uh, what do you think of like movies like, like Steve McQueen films that have shots within shots that go across screen? The, the more recent or sort of recent film I can think of was the original Hulk by Ang Lee, yes. <laughs> which was done like a comic book. I found it interesting and I kind of miss that. I don't see it as much, but I think, I think it's very interesting. What do you it's interesting, so I started doing that with my YouTube videos where I'll be uh, posting the, the video, I'll do a split screen. So not like, I feel like we've become so much more sophisticated as audience members with social media and cell phones where we can take in a lot more information than we used to. And so I feel like now as a viewer, you can kind of keep up with two things happening at once. Whereas five or 10 years ago, that would have been a lot more frustrating. Um, I remember, yeah, like 24 was like that, or uh, there's this movie Narc by um, Joe Carnahan, where it's like all this kind of split screen stuff, where I remember seeing it back in the day, it, it felt um, I was like disoriented. But now, now I'm just like used to it. Because typically, I always like, I'll have a movie going on one screen, I'll have YouTube on the other screen, like writing a screenplay, checking my phone. Uh, we're, we're just like, I think we're, we're, our brains are sort of supercharged these days where we're able to, to take in a lot more information. So I'm starting to think about that in terms of editing where people can handle, can handle sort of two things at once. Where I, I used to worry about that and not want, wanting to overload the audience, but now I think people can, people can kind of keep up. You're not supposed to admit to any of that. Yes, exactly. But yeah, it's scary just to see like how much uh, we're changing as people in terms of, of what we watch and how much we watch and how quickly it comes to us and how much in control of it we are. So it's, a, it, it's all very intimidating. And they do tell you like before you watch a film or before COVID, like they would say you got to turn off your cell phones and people do have the attention span. Uh, and it does surprise me on some level to yeah. still sit through a movie quietly. Right. You know? not it's, talking or playing on their phones. It's hard for me to do like, he, 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 even during quarantine to like find 90 minutes to just sit down and watch a movie without any distractions. It's, it's like really difficult to do. I kind of miss that about the 90s. You know, we used to just watch movies all the time and just get absorbed in them and lose ourselves in them. It's like hard to do now. Amazing, all of it. 
Elliot, thank you for coming and talking to us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Elliot. It was nice very informative. Oh, good. Hopefully, hopefully everyone learned something. Amazing. If, if anybody has like follow-up questions or wants to just research um, you more, where can they find you? Yeah, so uh, uh, I, my website is www.divinipictures.com, D-I-V-I-N-E-Y pictures, and then that's got all my uh, movies and um, YouTube stuff. I do a daily meme, uh, Photoshop. I try and uh, put up doodles. I just like doing all kinds of different stuff. I like the variety. I never want to get bored. So I always want to be working on something different. So that's, I just say yes to everything. And I always have like 30 projects going at once, but that's the way I like it. Amazing. So yeah, uh, divinipictures.com. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> thank you everybody. <clears throat> yes. have, a run, have a wonderful rest of your week and we will see you next time. Okay. Thanks everybody.